Um, long ago and far away, um, when I was a senior in college, I uh, went to Professor Hollander's office um, to talk to him about American and liberal left's perceptions of Stalin. So it's a great privilege to be here today uh, with him. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about some work that I've been uh, doing over the last couple of years. And usually this is a presentation that's done with a, a sociologist, uh, Ted Gerber, from the University of Wisconsin. He is the data guy. Uh, he's the quantitative person on this team. Uh, so there are some places where, and we have a limited amount of time, where I'm going to be highlighting some numbers for you. And if you have specific questions about the statistical analysis, I'm going to refer you to the person who's not in the room. Um, at CSIS, I run this program, the Human Rights and Security Initiative, where we look at a number of security implications of human rights abuse in a number of contexts. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, a considerable focus of our work, which focuses on historical or absent memory. Um, let me just give you a quick definition of what absent memory is, and then I'll go back and tell you a bit more about our work. How a state and a society reconciles or not with violent episodes of the past has profound yet really underspecified implications for political social development. Uh, we, and by we I mean human rights activists that I work with in Russia um, and in the United States and elsewhere, assume that wanting to look back, wanting to understand what happened in the past correlates or can lead to a greater appreciation of human rights and, and support for the rule of law. And obviously if terrible crimes have been committed related to torture, indefinite detention, or disappearance, the ability to prosecute um, has a bearing on the robustness of the, of the law. The preliminary findings that I'm going to discuss from Russia today suggests that this relationship of wanting to look back and rights is actually a little bit more complicated than we had hoped to find. Uh, and we did this work initially with colleagues from uh, the human rights organization in Russia, Memorial. We were trying to identify essentially who among the younger generation of Russians would be possible um, future workers in Memorial. Uh, because if you know anything about Memorial, the average age of those in the organization is hovering somewhere between 65 and 75. So the work that we're doing at CSIS on this includes what I'm going to talk to you today about a 2005 and 2007 survey of Russian youth and their views on, among other things, Stalin. We are currently, that is later today, I'm finishing a survey that looks at young ethnic Russians in Estonia and comparing their views with, eth with ethnic Estonians in Estonia and young Russians in Russia on a variety of these same questions. Later this year, we're going to do a multi-generational survey in Russia on views of, of history. We also have, as part of this work, uh, we're looking at lessons learned from other contexts and at the risk of wandering into that moral equivalence, we think there is something to be learned from colleagues in Argentina and Chile and Northern Ireland and elsewhere, Germany and Poland, and how they've moved the field of memory um, in, in their respective contexts. So the work that we're talking about today draws on these large random sample surveys that first we did focus groups in 2004 and 2007, and then we wrote the survey instrument. And as you can see, these are large uh, uh, random sample surveys that were conducted by the Levada Analytic Center, which is the most reputable uh, polling organization in Russia. Um, and if, you'll, if you think about it for a moment, the, the young people that were doing the focus groups with and then the surveys could in some ways be considered either the Helsinki generation, right? They're born the eldest at about 1976, or the fall of the Berlin Wall generation, right? With the youngest being born around 1989. Unfortunately, what we find over and over and over again is it's the Putin generation. Uh, these are young people who have really responded to and embraced, internalized a lot of the messages that, the Putin, that Putin himself and other senior uh, Kremlin officials have advanced. Uh, we've written about this in Foreign Affairs and the Washington Quarterly. Um, some of the work that I'm going to be presenting today in my short period of time is uh, still preliminary, and I ask that if, if you are going to cite anything that you, you contact us, uh, contact me. 
Um, so quickly, I'm going to be walking you through views of young Russians on Russia today, that is Russia's political trajectory. Uh, and by today, I really do mean 05 and 07. We'll see later in 2009 how they, they view Russia today. Uh, we'll be talking about young Russians' views of Stalin um, and a hypothesis that we had that looking back would, si wanting to look back would signal or correlate with those who would be most human rights friendly and uh, what our results were and, and what it means. Um, and just a warning, we end on, on a somewhat somber note, um, but maybe we can um, cheer ourselves up over a question and answer. Um, Russia Today, I probably don't need to describe for this audience um, the various ways in which in the last <clears throat> eight, nine years, political space in Russia has shrunk, uh, whether you're looking at television, uh, elections, parties, uh, NGOs, rampant abuse by uh, the police and the rise of the security services. Okay, so that's a snapshot. When you ask Russians in 05 and 07, and I realize there are people at the back of the room, maybe even in the front of the room, who, who won't be able to read these numbers, what you find is that by 2007, um, a majority, that is 56% of Russians agree uh, somewhat agree or fully agree that Russia is currently on the right path. Uh, and you have about 29% in 2007 who fully disagree or somewhat disagree. All right, this is a, this is a complex, or this is a, has a lot of information and in little time, so I'm going to just highlight a few things. We asked a battery of, of questions on how young people think about Stalin. Um, we asked, and I'm, I'm only going to report a few of these results, whether or not they thought Stalin was a wise leader. Um, and in 2005, we found a majority, that is 52%, uh, somewhat or fully agreed with that. By 2007, it was 49%. We asked, and, and this number has been quoted many places, uh, Stalin may have made some mistakes, but he did more good than bad. And in both 2005 and 2007, we find a majority believe that Stalin did more good than bad. Now, we thought, well, okay, maybe they don't know about what happened. Um, Stalin was directly responsible for the imprisonment, torture, and execution, and it should say, of millions of innocent people. Uh, and it's, the question's cut off. We find overwhelming majorities know this. 72% uh, in 05 and 68% in 07 somewhat agree and fully agree that Stalin was directly responsible. So on the one hand, we have a majority saying that Stalin did more good than bad, but we have an overwhelming majority also saying uh, that, that Stalin was directly responsible. Um, and we, that is our first signal that, in fact, what we see is a tremendous amount of ambivalence in how young people are thinking about Stalin. We had a few other questions that I'm going to run us through um, that give us a sense of the, the viewpoints of, of young Russians today. Um, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the, the greatest, it should say, geostrategic catastrophe of the 20th century. This is a statement that Vladimir Putin made in a 2005 State of the Union address. Um, these are the two, so 2007 findings. 63% of young Russians uh, agree, somewhat agree, fully agree. Um, we think that this is a nice barometer of, of where Rus you know, Russians in general, but young Russians are, are uh, how they view and whether or not they agree with the, 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 the world view that, that Putin is advancing. And later this year we'll know whether or not this, this translates across different generations. We suspect, based on focus groups, which you cannot generalize on, but we're going to test the hypothesis, that in fact there is a demographics of memory and that in fact um, the initial hypothesis that we had, which did not bear out, was we thought, and, and I think this is going to be something that Andre picks up more on, the, the, the assumption was that uh, as Russia developed economically, that as people got iPods and skateboards and traveled to the West and drank lattes, that somehow they would become more human rights friendly, more democratic, uh, and we just see none of that in, in, the, in the survey data. Um, what we saw in the focus groups that we did in July, in fact, was in praise of 
the middle age, that actually the 40-somethings um, may be the generation in Russia that is more sympathetic to democracy and human rights. And we suspect it has nothing to do with economic development. It has to do with where they were when the Soviet Union collapsed. But that's something that we, we need a lot more uh, work on. Okay, so let's, in my remaining time, talk a little bit about young Russians on remembering. Now, um, we don't have enough time to walk through this in any kind of detail. This is all, just to say that the hypothesis, and, and we're going to do more work on this later this year, we thought that if we, we had a, a variety of questions that would suggest to us whether or not young people were eager, or at least some segment of that demographic, were eager to learn more about the past, that they would also correlate with human rights um, friendly views, and that that might be a demographic that Memorial and other human rights organizations might move towards, and that we'd have some understanding of those views by looking at how they thought about Russia's current path, views on Stalin and Soviet collapse, and we asked a, a variety of questions also about views of Memorial, views of the Kremlin-funded uh, youth group NASHI, uh, Democracy and Human Rights. Um, very briefly, and I, we just don't have enough time to go through this, the three questions that we asked to, to measure barometer on whether or not we could consider young people eager learners or forgetters, as we called them, people who wanted to forget about what happened. We asked, number one, how would you describe your level of knowledge about the history of the USSR during the Stalin era? I shudder to think what Professor Hollander's students, how they might have responded to this. We asked... The next question, some say that Russia needs to move forward and forget about the Stalin period. Others say that we should learn more about that period so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Which of the following statements is closest to your view? And we ask a variety. There's no harm in looking back. We should learn more about the period, avoid repeating the mistakes. We need to forget about the Stalin period, move forward. And we had a third question. Some say there's too much discussion in media, television, private conversations about Soviet-era repressions, and these discussions hurt Russia. Others disagree. Which of the following statements is closest to your view? The punchline in all of this is that we had, um, through statistical analysis, uh, which Ted Gerber um, performed, we found a, a variety of views. The strongest, the modality of ambivalence that people expressed a lot of ambivalence about what they wanted to know. We clearly identified eagers and forgetters, uh, people who really did want to know about the past, people who absolutely didn't want to know about the past, and people who are uncertain. And it was not surprising that uh, you found people who, hard to say, modal response to all three questions, um, and we found complacent uh, respondents. Now, how did those various categories, excuse me, line up with views on Russia's on the right path, views on Stalin, collapse as catastrophe, and, and views on human rights. The punchline, ladies and gentlemen, is that there was no clear relationship between the learner categories and attitudes towards these, these issues. There's statistically significant findings, but they're contradictory or counterintuitive relationships. Specifically, if you, if you thought about a measure that... In, you know, we can argue that maybe these are not the correct measures, but views on Stalin, whether Russia's on the right path, whether the Soviet collapse was a catastrophe or not, and uh, questions that we don't report here on human rights, that torture is never acceptable. We thought that if you were, you thought Russia was not on the right path, that you really did want to know more about Stalin, that you didn't think that the Soviet collapse was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe, and that torture is never acceptable, that that would be a category... Uh, that suggested that you would come out as a coherent worldview, right, and that you would, you would be an eager learner and more human rights ambivalent. Unfortunately, we found no difference on Russia on the right path among eager, ambivalent, or forgetters. We found no differences among eager, ambivalent, and complacent on views in Stalin. In fact, the least pro-Stalin were the forgetters, uh, which is a problem, especially if you're thinking about trying to build a robust human rights movement in Russia and trying to bolster Memorial and, and other human rights organizations. Um, the fact that, you know, that this eager and, and the eager learners and the forgetters end up 
um, not having significant differences on, on a number of these questions really calls into question, I think, how we, we, we still believe it's important for young people to know about what happened in the past. And we still believe that not knowing about what happened allows for all sorts of things to go on today, uh, including the rise of the security services without reform, um, you know, the second war in Chechnya, uh, control of, of television. But it, it means that it's even more complicated in Russia than, than we had anticipated. Um, the implications of this work going forward are that, frankly, there is no cohesive collective memory. Um, there is, in fact, the possibility that focusing again and again on the role of victims has a way of shutting people down. And um, it may be that we need to identify more heroes, that a, a lot of times um, you, you don't hear about the, the few defiant who stand up against Stalin. Um, I remember reading a book by Adam Hochschild not too long ago where he identified this incredibly brave young woman who at the tender age of, I don't know, something like 16, actually was in an anti-Stalinist cell uh, and was arrested and all the other folks that she was arrested with were shot. And this woman still lives in Moscow. Um, and you know, no one knows about her, uh, and, and there's no documentary made on her life. Um, we have a fundamental problem that this desire to remember, which is really a, a, a kind of an assumption in much human rights work and in transitional justice work, that the desire to remember does not equate with human rights friendly views, that memorial does not lack an easily identifiable target audience. Um, so we're left at the end of the research um, with the same question that we had in some ways in the beginning, which was how do you move the memory field forward if you believe that understanding the past is and acknowledging the past is critical to um, Russia's political trajectory and challenging the shrinkage of, of political space in Russia, then how do you move it forward in a way that, that doesn't turn people off? Um, and I think, you know, this is, um, you know, parts of this we've published, parts of this is preliminary. We need to see whether or not there's been a shift by 2009, whether or not we see uh, younger generations in 2009 looking any different from how they looked in 05 and 07, um, and whether or not ethnic Russians in Estonia uh, are looking somewhat different. The preliminary findings from the focus groups that we did in March uh, 2009 with there were four groups of ethnic Russians in Estonia. And the, 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 the way in which we sliced and diced that group was we had two focus groups with young ethnic Russians who held Estonian citizenship and we had two focus groups with young Russians who had alien passports. And here's Here's the optimistic note. The young ethnic Russians that had Estonian passports were integrating, that their mentality was much more European. Uh, Russia was not the answer for any of these people in this focus group. They were not looking to Russia to solve their problems. But the young ethnic Russians who had alien passports were, not surprisingly, alienated. They had not integrated. Um, they had not felt the the, uh, the 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 hand of Moscow, if you will. They did. There was not a lot of evidence that, and they didn't believe that Moscow really cared about them. Um, but they also didn't believe that Tallinn cared about them uh, as well. Um, and so they're kind of somewhat vulnerable population. That you know, whoever gets there first, they could they'll lean in in a different direction. Um, but you know, as a as a young person after the Soviet Union collapsed. I went to work in Moscow on political party development, thinking that Russia's trajectory was going in a certain way. And the young ethnic Russians in the focus groups in Estonia who had Estonian citizenship were essentially the young people that we were looking for. Uh, they, were, they were interested in the past. Um, they, they acknowledged what happened. Uh, and, um, and we're going to end with that. And the idea that in some ways... Perhaps it was 
their ability to, you know, these people live in a NATO and EU member country, um, and the battles had been, in some ways, fought, and, you know, they were interested in, in having a normal life and, and being European. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much.